Time for a game we call overrated or underrated. I'm going to read out a list of things and you are going to tell me if they are overrated or underrated. So lots of people have sent in suggestions. Here's a few from Shenandoah in Bendigo in Australia. Big Sunnies. So he says, love my sutros, but wear them off the bike like a yob. <laughs> I... Yeah, hay fever. Yeah, I like big sunnies for anti-hay fever. I dislike them because I have a small face and all sunglasses look stupid ah, on me. Small sunnies are big sunnies on you. Yeah. Very small, very yeah. small face. Mm. So like I, a lot of the, a lot of the ones, because we've got loads of sunglasses scattered around, I don't pick up nearly all of them <laughs> because they're just, they just look like silly. You know, those like kids goggle, those kids sunglasses, which are like clown ones almost. All, all cycling glasses look like that on me. That is what you look like. I am pretty certain that cycling glasses as fashion glasses are coming in. I can't remember where we were. Where were we when we were walking around a street? At London. We were in London for the Van Rysel store opening. And that is surely the capital of fashion. And there were two men, I would say probably in their early 20s, in a separate in separate incidents, I saw and they had like big old cycling glasses yeah. on their face, just wearing them completely unironically. So I have to assume <laughs> that they are coming in. People think, go clubbing in them. I yeah. think Tom Ford and Prada have just dropped some like new glasses that are basically cycling glasses, but they're not. Oh, and Zara have as well. Yeah, so there you go. So I that that was always my limiting factor with sunglasses, uh, with cycling sunglasses. I thought they looked ridiculous, but everyone wears them on a bike, so you blend in. But now, actually, everyone's just going to be wearing them. I, I actually, I, I want to get, I, I keep meaning to do it, but I end up never doing it. I want to get the Oakleys that were fashionable about 20 years ago. So I can't even remember what they're called. They're like... Uh, almost like running. They get used a lot in running. I'm going to get a set of them because mm. they're small, not massive. Not cool me. What are we saying? Uh, for me, obviously overrated. Underrated. Cycling in the Southern Hemisphere. Underrated. I've never done it. It's, uh, it's all on you, this one. No, Tenerife is technically not the Southern Hemisphere. It's not even technically. It's definitely not the Southern You're Hemisphere. Limited it's off the coast of Africa. Are... Yeah, but the top. Isn't the top of... Afri isn't the whole of Africa the, the southern no, hemisphere? No, Jimmy. Is it not? No, it the through equator's Africa? through the, yeah, the middle yeah, of Africa. Yeah, through the middle. Okay, yeah. I would um, love to do more cycling in the southern hemisphere. There's um, a few places which uh, need prior planning and some careful consideration of where to go. Some places in Africa. Did you see, you know, Hardest Geezer? Russ Cook, yeah. the guy who ran the length of Africa. Yeah. First person to ever run the full length of Africa. Um he did a podcast, I can't remember who with, and he tells the story which he'd never told, which was getting kidnapped in the in DRC. Congo. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the sort of thing you'd want to avoid, especially if you're riding a bike. Yeah. Um, I guess like, because he was on foot, he was a little bit more like stuck and people weren't going to run after him. He was, he can't, I mean, he, he eventually got away by running, but. If you're on a bike, you probably get out of situations a little bit quicker. However, you're then carrying more like flashy, expensive stuff, and potentially drawing more attention to yourself. Mm. So I would love to. Just got to be careful where you go. Yeah. I mean, the Southern Hemisphere is obviously a very large place as well. Oh, Shen yes, yeah, Shenandoah yeah. is from Australia. You've been Australia there. is fine. Yeah. 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 Although I've ridden a lot in Australia, but I wish I'd ridden. I would like to ride in different places. The Nullarbor, it's the Nullarbor Plain, which is very, very long. I think there's two or three main roads which go all the way through. I mean, well, is it the longest straight road in the world, I think. Definitely the longest straight road in Australia is there, and it's hundred and something miles long. And then there is nothing, except for a few road houses. Uh, not the most interesting ride in the world. <laughs> Over it or under it? Underrated. Underrated. I'm not going to comment because I've not. Really Most people it. just go to Spain, don't they? That's not the Southern Hemisphere. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Explore more. Chocolate. Be careful. Chocolate bars as ride snacks. I I want them to. I would like to say they're underrated, but they're always just going to melt. So Southern Hemisphere. Rubbish. No way. <laughs> <laughs> Having spoke to Will off 
off our podcast last week, they're not the optimal ride snack. Too much, too much fat. Too much fat, yeah. which might cause belly issues and that kind of thing. I mean, if you like them, do it, whatever. I mean, I am a chocolate lover, but I think it is going to melt. And also just maybe a bit, bit like sticky around your mouth as well. You've then got to swill it out and stuff. I think there's probably better options. I, I did used to use Mars bars and Snickers for running mm. where, I, where I was doing like ultra distance stuff. You just, slick, you just have them in your backpack. So they're not going to melt in your backpack because it's not actually getting that hot. Um, and that was great just to have some what felt like solid food. <laughs> Cheap as well compared to purpose-made stuff. Mm-hmm. Yep. Maybe not the perfect ratios of carbs to fat to protein, but... So I say overrated. Three-quarter length bib nicks. So I know in Australia they call tights. Nicks. Knickers or nicks. Overrated. So three-quarter length. Yeah. I've also decided, I thought about it the other day. I don't think knee warmers need to exist either. Oh. Leg warmers or no leg warmers. I've decided for me. It's fine. Tan lines are better. You either have no tan or normal short tan. And then the in-between is just not needed. I th- what I like about knee warmers is, so knees are an, uh, a very a joint that are very um, susceptible to damage, especially the older you get. You'll understand that when you get a bit older, Francis. Mm. <laughs> uh, what I like about knee warmers is that they're, smaller it's like a more compact thing to put on and off especially if you're going to take them off mid-ride three-quarter length tights i don't i just i just can't imagine me ever using them so i'm going to say overrated Mm. i think i've never tried them however as i was putting on a pair of knee warmers the other day i hate them so much (laughs) i hate them because they just they cut off if you haven't got very 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 skinny legs Um, And I think it's more of a problem for women because we tend to hold more fat in our upper thighs. It just cuts you off. It feels horrible. They do the sausage thing. They do the sausage thing. That is not a body fat percentage thing. I don't think. Even when I was racing, I'm like, and they just look weird. Yeah. I think they either do the sausage thing or they just slip (laughs) down. I remember when we first met, you were like, I hate these. They never stay up. And it's like, yeah, because you haven't got enough fat on you. Like, you know what I mean? Like they're made, they're made Mm. in one size fits all and people's legs are not one size fits all. For me, they just create a sausage effect and I hate it. I actually think... I don't want to wear bib tights or thermal bib tights. So either like a summer bib tight or a summer three quarter length, I think is what I'm going to invest in next. So I I can't say that I have tried them, but I think potentially they are underrated. And I know that they definitely perform better. They sell better with women. Definitely. I think because of that reason. So so you're thinking like an early... Uh, a spring ride exactly. or, or like a summer ride where you're going out early and it's like 10 degrees lower than it's going to be later on in the day. So you just want a bit of extra protection. You're not going to be out all day kind of thing. I would actually only use them on a ride where I know it's either short or the weather's not going to change mm. because ultimately you're treating it as a ride where you're never taking them off because you never take them off. So Interesting. either I'd wear shorts and just deal with it being cold for a bit. Or I know that I'm just going to go out and do our local loop. It's an hour and it's going to stay around 10 degrees. I would wear those. You've convinced me. I I, kind of want to set now. Yeah. They don't have to be three quarter length, but I think again, in in terms of women's um, sports fashion, three quarter length is quite fashionable, but it doesn't have to be. It could be full length summer bib tights. I like a bib tight. Yeah. I want to say... Back when we used to race, there was this thing of no one's ever won in leg warmers. And then I remember Chris Opie winning Perth's pedal race. Chris Opie, who used to be GCM presenter. Mm. And someone was like, oh, leg warmers. He's like, nope, tights. That's why he won. It's <laughs> because <laughs> he was wearing tights. It's like freezing cold race, early season, like hail, snow, horrible. No one's ever won in leg warmers. There we go. If you have ever won in leg warmers, please send us a picture of you on a podium. Loads of people. <laughs> In, in England, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, next up, uh, also from James, super reflective winter wear like uh, Provis. You know, there's like full on outfits of reflective stuff. Wait, what? When the light hits them, they become very... The whole thing? Yes, but otherwise they look quite grey. I used to have one, I used to commute in one. I think probably overrated. I bought a child's one because it was significantly cheaper and it just about fit me. Um, and I used to commute in that, but on reflection, I think if I was to do it now, I would be wearing high vis 
maybe with a little bit of a reflective strip, but I think that the issue is that it doesn't give, if you, if visibility is what you want, I would probably just go high vis. It's significantly cheaper as well. Well, I, I think where they're good is if you are going to be somewhere where you're being approached by something that definitely has lights on, you are going to glow. Yeah. Uh, I think they are, I think the fabric, because we use some of the fabric on the back of our bib tights when we had Atticus. So the, mm. there's two stripes on the back of each leg that are made from this type of fabric. The problem with it is it's massively unbreathable. They're, they're, oh, they, they're like boiling the bag. That coat that I had yeah, was boiling the bag. Yeah, it's horrible to wear. Yeah. I think Pro Viz did one which has got loads of holes punched in it, but I imagine it's still similar. So the fabric as a fabric is pretty cool or pretty cool tech. But yeah, I think it's in, in practice, it's actually a horrible thing to wear. Mm. I'm going to say overrated because I can just go bright colors. Yes. I'm, and light myself up with tons of bike lights. Overrated. Um, stupid victim blaming. You should be able to go outside without getting run over. <laughs> just like this. Uh, the next one is funky anodized bolts or color coordinated bolts, uh, cable ends, hoses, etc. Is there such a thing as too much bling? So like all the little details on a bike being color coded. I think it is overrated. However, I think a bit of detail can be really, really nice. I think it's, it looks, I don't like it when someone goes like hardcore and just like, it becomes more than just a bit of detail and it becomes extreme. But some stuff I think is really cool. Does that, the, the other person's bike offend you enough that you go, I don't like it? Oh no, because if if someone has done it and they like their bike, then that's cool. If it's, that's like, what I was if it's, if exactly. it's my bike, then it would offend me, but it isn't my bike. I don't care. Mm -hmm. Like if someone enjoys it, then excellent. Yep, do what you want, underrated. However, for my personal bikes, I would always just do black. I would do, I do like a little bit of a pop. So like, say, say like, uh, um, the seat post collar matching, say like bottle cages. Mm. So there's just like a little, little ping. That's, that's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, in general, don't like it. <laughs> Saddles with cutout pressure relief channels. So this is suggested by Matthias in Copenhagen, who said, on paper, it seems like a great idea for long days in the saddle, but I haven't had great results when I tried them. So he says he tested out two saddles, one with and one without a cutout, for a full season and found the one with the holes cause soreness, chafing and numbness, which is something it's apparently designed to prevent. He acknowledged everyone's built differently, but says a big chunk of cyclists seem to be getting on the hype train with these. What are our thoughts? Everyone's looking at me. <laughs> I filmed a lot of episodes of Bike Fit Tuesdays to know, know the you, situation well, here. I know you both have an opinion on these. Quite yeah. a strong, well, not necessarily a strong one, but you have definite opinions on them. Yeah. yeah. It, uh, saddles with pressure relief channels are Bike Fit James' most sold saddles. Uh, people who don't get on with them well have their saddles too high. <laughs> so they're interacting asymmetrically with the saddle or they just are asymmetric themselves so they it's often people who, who do sports like golf um so they 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 will never really get on with a pressure release channel because it is symmetrical and you're not so some people just sit on a bike on a wonk you have yeah scoliosis yes is that your condition yeah so you, i imagine that does contribute to your experience with a saddle with a pressure relief channel because you on it the point of it is that it takes away pressure from the sensitive parts in your underneath, you know, your, your undercarriage. And if that's not hitting them, hitting in the right place, you're, all you're doing is creating loads of pressure on the edges of it. And it just messes you up. Would wow. that not be the case with all saddles though? That all saddles are symmetrical. And well, if you're not. yes, that is an issue with saddles. Um, because you're getting humans aren't symmetrical. Yeah. Maybe there's one or two in the world. <laughs> the saddles are all symmetrical. I think, unless there is, some that aren't. I guess that, well, actually, yeah, there is. The one we mold. Mm -hmm. We molded the saddle. Yep. And it's like a plug-in saddle that, anyway, that's aside the point. Most saddles are symmetrical. And if you are not, you can then experience problems with a pressure relief channel. Yeah, so my mum my is a podiatrist and she 
firmly believes that most people have fun functional limb length discrepancy, mm -hmm. which means that functional meaning that the way you actually move, you have one leg functions longer than the other. So you might not see it when you stand, but as you actually move, that will be the case. And the way she would combat that would be um, orthotics. So a, a wedge in, in one of your shoes to the point, you know, you work with a specialist to do that. Yeah. Obviously the mechanics of walking, the mechanics of cycling are slightly different, but there was, cause there was one point where my mum was like, shall we actually put a wedge on one side of your saddle to keep my, cause my hips are sort of, uh, yeah. We never did that. Maybe we, should, maybe, no, we didn't. maybe you should try the molded saddle. Yeah. However, I have found on, generally on cut out saddles, I have now found one which I'm really happy with, which is the Physique R3 or R5. I don't remember. But before that, I was using the only way I know how to describe wavy it is woo. the wavy woo saddle. <laughs> Seller SMP, is yeah. that what it's called? That one was horrible. And I think maybe that kept me in too much of a rigid position because you really sort of, it has this great dip that re you end up sitting in quite, I found I've sat too heavily in it and I re then really couldn't move and that wasn't good. But the, the physique one that I've got, it's got quite a large cutout as well. Um, and that works really well. So it's hard to, I think saddles are just so personal to you and also potentially where you're getting pain isn't necessarily the cause of the pain as well, which makes it very difficult. It's one of the reasons, so my mum was a podiatrist, but she also then 10 years ago started to study massage and she's now also a masseuse because she found most people's knee and feet issues actually come from hips and back. So rather than treating the symptoms, she wanted to be able to treat the cause. Mm. Uh, so yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's a difficult one. And I think that finding comfort on a bike is a very, very long and arduous process. I can't say that I'm there a hundred percent. I'm definitely better than I was, but it's difficult. And I think it also um, changes with your conditioning as well. So oh, I've, I've had a long period off the bike and I rode for the first time in a long time on whenever, Saturday or Friday or whatever it was. And I had almost blisters on the palms of my hands, which I've never experienced before. Same setup that I've always had. Uh, this is my gravel bike, which I don't think is too long for me, but I think just that lack of conditioning and the fatigue has obviously caused me to sit in a weird way. And I've now got this painful thing on my hands, which I've never had before. So it's hard, isn't it? I, 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 don't, I don't know what the the correct answer is, I don't think that they're overrated. I think it's just very personal. Yeah, I don't think it's a hype thing either. I think probably, I, I would imagine in most cases, people are going to be better off with them. I have talked about it before. I am not very sensitive to small adjustments on stuff. I've, I think every single one of my bikes that I've had over the last few, four or five years which is more than I would like to admit, has had a different saddle on and I've got on fine with all of them. Mm. And I have four or five that I use regularly that are all different and none of them do I think this one's better than that one. And they're all very different. Some have cutaways, some don't have cutaways. Uh, I think I'm in that respect, I guess I'm quite fortunate that I can kind of just throw stuff on and it mostly works. Yeah. So much of it is uh, feet and the your shoe fit and your arch support in the shoes and again like wedging and stuff i think that's why james spends so long on shoes and then if you're still having problems with a saddle that's the only time he'll then switch out his usual pressure relief recommendation to something else and that's just because at least you're getting some support if you're sitting wonky but i think the his goal is to try and stop someone from sitting wonky first in the first place in the first, exactly yeah. and then they they pressure map it while you are making those changes so you can see where the pressure on the saddle is during that process. But he doesn't like to rely on that too much. Mm. He said, he he's always said like, he could still do a bike fit with none of the fancy equipment. You don't want to just rely on pressure relief, but it's a added it's a tool, thing. It's it? a tool, yeah. It's like it's having not a, a tape measure. If you don't know what you're doing with it, it's pointless. Yeah. But if you have the tool and you do know what you're doing with it, it's really useful. So, mm. so what yeah. we're saying, overrated, underrated? I think underrated for most people. It, it, yeah. it annoys me that loads and loads of bikes that sold entry-level bikes like Decathlon, make and they're selling them for you know 600 quid it's probably quite a new rider getting you know might be their first real great road bike and it comes with a plank it could just be a saddle with a pressure relief channel i'm sure it's not that much more expensive to manufacture and it will be better for 90 percent of people mm. probably 
Saddles on entry-level bikes are always junk, aren't Crap, they? Crap, aren't they? Gore-Tex cycling apparel. So this is suggested by Lorenzo. I love my 300 euro Gore-Tex jacket. It's extremely light, comfortable, perfectly waterproof and windproof. I think the technology truly works, but I leave, believe the brand overclaims its benefits. It's supposed to make you waterproof and at the same time let your sweat evaporate out. In my experience, rain may not enter, but I still end up wet by my own sweat. For this reason, I say it's overrated. Still, I can genuinely say it feels better than a normal plastic rain jacket. I think you are very qualified to answer this question, but can I ask a silly question to start with? I have a gore shake dry jacket. Mm -hmm. Is that Gore-Tex? Yes. Okay. So Gore, to get that straight. so Gore-Tex is the fabric manufacturer. Gore is the company. Gore is the brand of clothing that uses Gore-Tex cool. fabric. So if, so for example, when Rafa did a shake, shake dry, it, the, there will be a condition that Gore-Tex branding is on the product and it will be Gore-Tex, not Gore. So it's the same company. Gore and Gore-Tex are the same company. Gore-Tex make the fabric. And license it. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think his assessment is pretty accurate. I think that I have, having looked at lots of waterproof fabrics, I think there's a lot of stuff right with Gore-Tex and I like it and I would probably use it. I have things that are Gore-Tex, but the sweat but, but evaporation... It's, but it's not all Gore-Tex. It's the specific fabric that they have that's, uh, they claim it's 28,000 Hydrohead. Hydra yeah. head. Uh, not all of their fabrics are the same. Yes. But you're specifically on about the fabric that's used in the shake dry, the, to- the premium fabric yes, they do. Yes, exactly. I think that they're, they're good because they're light, they pack down, there's that sort of shake dry thing. You don't, it doesn't feel as boil in the bag, but I think a lot of that also, the comfort of it comes down to a good cut. Um, but I think that you are never going to find something that protects you, protects water from going in and also lets sweat go out the amount that you would like it to. And I think that's just a case of it. We, we explored something called Pertex as well, which is a very similar sort of material. And it's used a lot in the outdoor space. So um, like Rab and that kind of thing uses it. And it was the same thing again, very, very light, very, very waterproof, but yeah, it's, it's you're never going to get hundred percent. I don't think. M- my understanding is that it's nearly impossible to be completely waterproof and breathable. And that might sound ridiculous but if you think about it if it can't let something in on what grounds would it not be able to let would it then be able to let something out yeah and i feel like we've talked about this before and some people say oh well there's there are fabrics that can do it but i I don't know i I am yet to find one that does it to the point where you would want it to happen yeah Uh, having said that i still probably think that gore-tex high-end gore-tex cycling apparel if you can afford it it's worth having yeah it's it is it's overrated in the sense that some people claim that it is breathable because it isn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's underrated in in the sense that there aren't many cycling cut jackets that are in the same caliber as a shake dry jacket. Um, Pertex, as you mentioned, is a great mill as well. They do some amazing, amazing fabrics, but there's not that much in cycling. I feel like maybe Albion started using some Pertex. Yeah, they definitely mm. do one or two jackets. They look cool as well. We were going to use Pertex. We got some samples made in Pertex for a rain jacket when we had Atticus, uh, but it's really hard to access and very, very expensive. Is it true that it rubs off? Because I have worn my gore jacket in videos before years ago and I've had a backpack on and people are like, can't believe you're wearing your gore jacket with a backpack. I'm like, I didn't know about this. It still seems fine. And I've ridden it with a backpack on quite a lot because I have to. So there's, I actually don't know I don't know that level of detail about Gore-Tex, okay. I have to say. But as far as my understanding is, there's two types of waterproofing. There's a D- DWR treatment, which is a treat, uh, sort of almost like a waterproof layer that's put over the top of fabric. And then there are fabrics where it's almost woven in. Like if you think about a plastic bag, it is inherently by its material. It doesn't let water through. So my understanding was that Gore-Tex and Pertex, the the technology is in the fabric rather than on a coating. It might have both. I'm not sure. They'll, they'll, they'll be DWR treated as well. As well, yeah. So, so the reason stuff gets DWR, DWR treated is you get the beading effect and that became a marketing thing, didn't mm. it? Where it was just like, oh, look, it's beading. It's really good. That was just a treatment. <laughs> yes, that is just a chemical treatment on the outside of the fabric. So if the fabric's junk, it will look like that. The, the, the DWR washes off after 
a few washes and you have to retreat them. Um, whereas the hydro head rating is how actual good the fabric is. Will it rub off the actual? It would. You would probably find that a really premium fabric is potentially more sensitive, softer, and therefore what you might actually do is just damage the fabric by wearing jackets. Mm. However, it would should still be good, as far as I'm aware. Cool. Yeah, but but also with the caveat of we we haven't properly properly tested that, so I wouldn't know. I bet there's some sort of material expert listening who can tell us in the comments if a fabric that can let something go one way but not the other way is possible no it is but not to an extent that it's fully waterproof and fully breathable okay right it you they do it does you can make fabrics where it goes but both ways but not to that extreme extent mm -hmm. so actually the best waterproof jackets are probably ones that are made from multiple fabrics so that you have for example um, panels in certain places that are very breathable fabrics that allow moisture to escape. And that's often what you found with the really top-end Gore-Tex type jackets is actually one of the reasons that they come across as being more breathable is because they're just really well designed. They've got panels in the right places. They've got vents in the right places. They allow heat and sweat moisture to escape while still providing good coverage. It's always the zip as well, isn't it? They have like a flap thing that covers up the zip properly. And that's always a place where water gets in on jackets. Thank you for all those awesome suggestions. If you have a topic you want us to debate on overrated or underrated, please send it to wildonespodcast at cademedia.co.uk. We might read yours out in a future episode.